Hello, this is Abbott Austin for another session of Talk Lexio, where we'll do uh, the steps, the four steps of Lexio Divina. In this episode, we'll do it with Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. So this is uh, Sunday's gospel reading, tomorrow's gospel reading, the uh, 23rd Sunday in Ordinary Time. Um, so uh, we have this passage, and we'll follow the four steps of Lexio Divina, of reading it, then meditating on it, praying from it, and then contemplating based on that. All right, so we'll start then with prayer as always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we ask you to open our hearts and our minds to understand your scriptures, so that we may know your will better and have the joy of living by it, through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So again, it's Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20. As I read it, uh, notice what strikes you. What, uh, what jumps out at you? What questions does this text raise? And because what the whatever jumps out at you or the questions it raises, those will be your starting points for the next step of meditation. Jesus said to his disciples, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won over your brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, so that every fact may be established on the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, then treat him as he would a Gentile or a tax collector. Amen, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, amen, I say to you, if two of you, if two of you agree on earth about anything for which they are to pray, it shall be granted to them by my heavenly Father. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So I'll read it again. Again, uh, listen, be attentive, see what strikes you or uh, what raises questions about this uh, or from this text. Jesus said to his disciples, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won over your brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you so that every fact may be established on the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, then treat him as he would a Gentile or a tax collector. Amen, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, amen, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything for which they are to pray, it shall be granted to them by my heavenly Father. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Okay, having read the passage, we now move to the second step of Lexia Divina, which is meditation. So here we're reflecting on the text and we'll, we'll use the things that jumped out at us as starting points, uh, things that raise questions in our minds. Okay, and I'll uh, identify some of them uh, with this passage as a way of helping us uh, to start this meditation. Now, I will say about this biblical passage, it's, it's a bit difficult, I think. And it's difficult and it raises a lot of questions. You know, so we have here, the context is that we're talking about a dispute within the faith community, within the church. So one believer has wronged another believer. So what does that wronged believer do? Right? This is instructions. How do you rectify that? Right? So for one, uh, we see that there will be wrongs done. Jesus is anticipating that even among believers, one believer will wrong another. So there needs to be a process uh, put in place. Not all the details are here what this would look like, and over time the church would discern how to deal with different uh, disputes like this. Um, but Jesus is giving a process, and that, that itself is important and worth noting, right? Um, when we want to pursue justice and right wrongs, it's very important, and this is common human experience, but Jesus shows the wisdom here as well, that you should have some kind of juridical process, right? Um, you know, when people get angry and excited uh, and you don't follow a process, you easily accuse people wrongly. Uh, you easily overreact and perhaps uh, try to right a wrong in a way that's excessive. Um, sometimes it can lead to a certain kind of a group of people, a mob, trying to pursue justice, and mobs are not vehicles for justice, right? So um, you can ruin someone's reputation when there's a misunderstanding, right? So there should be a process. This is good. Uh, so that's one thing to notice. Jesus recognizes that. This kind of general human wisdom 
it would be practiced also in the church. The other thing too is that um, it's important to have these kind of corrections. It's important when there is a wrong, uh, especially a serious wrong, that it is amended, that there is healing, that justice is restored and healing is pursued as much as possible. All right, so what is this pointing to? It's pointing to the fact that we belong to a community of believers, the church, and that we have a responsibility, each of us in his, in his or her own way, we have a responsibility to want to build up this community. All right, so I think sometimes as uh, Christians or Catholics, uh, we can take the faith community for granted and we don't see it as something we have to, each of us in his or her own way, each of us has to build up and work on, right? Relationships need work if they're gonna be good relationships. Communities need work if they're gonna be good communities, right? So we have the grace of Christ helping us, but we have to cooperate with that and work on community, right? It's not easy, right? It's often very difficult. Uh, sometimes we, we take a, uh, we fall into, I think, I don't think it's a, a malicious thing that we, we deliberately do this, but we fall into a kind of um, consumer mentality. Like we think, well, the church should give me that. It's like, you know, we're, like we're a consumer and, uh, buying something, right? The consumer is always right. And then the people selling things are, are trying to like cater to um, the consumer, right? And sure enough, the church should try to, uh, you know, help each of its members, but we're also members of the church and we have a responsibility. We're not just consumers. We have a responsibility to build up community. So out of justice, I owe something to the faith community to make it stronger and to keep it healthy. Each of us, that's true. Uh, what do I owe? What, you know, in this situation or that situation, what is it I owe to the community and justice to build it up? Okay, so we have this responsibility and we might think too, do we recognize that? Do we identify that we're members of a community and we all have a role in it to make it a healthy community that walks in righteousness? Okay, so um, I think all those things are implied in here. Okay, then Jesus goes through these different steps uh, in this process. The first one I, I want to dwell on a little bit. So, your brother, that is another member of the faith community, a fellow believer, has wronged you, right? Now, what happens when someone does something wrong to us? We often talk to other people about it. We start complaining, uh, we create kind of uh, gossip circles, and try to get people to sympathize with us. Okay, does that help? Often, no. Um, often, that just creates more tension and drama, and doesn't allow for eventually uh, healing to take place and a true restoration, a full restoration of justice or a fuller restoration. So uh, it usually doesn't help. So really, if you can, the better thing to do is just to go to that person one-on-one -on -one privately and see if you can work it out, right? So um, it just avoids a whole bunch of drama. It often avoids escalating it. And uh, you're not trying to shame or uh, you know, in this bad way of kind of humiliating or denigrating your, uh, the person who did you wrong. You're, in a way, when you do this, you're kind of opening a path for forgiveness and healing. It's not that the other person doesn't have to amend the wrong. They might have to do something to, they stole from you, for example, they should give you back the money, right? So, uh, but there could be forgiveness and healing. So this is very interesting. Uh, it's worth remembering, even in small matters, uh, just to go to the person, talk to the person. It takes courage to do that though. Uh, so we don't like confrontation, right? So it takes a bit of courage to do that. Uh, but it is uh, really the way we should try first. Okay, but if it doesn't work, what do you do? You bring in uh, two or three other people. And Jesus says this is to establish the fact. He's quoting here, every fact may be established in the testimony of two or three witnesses. This is general jurisprudence in a way. Uh, you don't want just my word versus your word. You want to bring in some other evidence. So that can be provided by um, other people who are witnesses. So you bring in some other people to help and you're trying to convince the person who did wrong to make amends. So you're not trying to you know, um, you know, make the other person uh, to destroy the other person in some kind of act of revenge and vindictiveness. You're trying to bring about healing. So this person did wrong. They should right the wrong, right? But then you forgive and you move on. Okay. So uh, it's not you're trying to like pound someone into the ground and make them feel bad and you know pay them back for the wrong they did. You're trying to establish uh, justice and healing. Okay. So um, you bring along some other people to help convince them. It does occur to me though that you're establishing a fact. So maybe this, this step can help in this way. Sometimes you might think somebody wronged us, but they, they didn't, right? That person didn't do so. 
Um, it's a misunderstanding or we wrongly perceive the situation. So when we bring in some other people, maybe that will come up that I thought that you wronged me, but by bringing in some other people, some fresh eyes, uh, we can't establish that. In fact, it, it's not true, right? So that can help, right? Because there can be misunderstandings in that regard. And then the third step uh, is that you bring it before the church. It's not clear. Here's where, again, all these questions can come up. Well, how does this work? Um, you know, what does it mean to bring it to the church here? What was Jesus foreseeing? Uh, it would be some kind of leadership in the church would probably have to handle this. You don't have to bring it to just a group of people, but some leadership, like a bishop. And, and in the early church, the bishop had to hear cases between believers, much as a judge would, because uh, they were trying to settle things within the community. Okay, um, so what does that mean? It, it's a lot of questions there. But again, I think one way to look at this is it's a matter of discernment. So uh, helping to show the person who did the wrong that they've done wrong and they need to amend for the good for their own good and for the good of the community, as well as for the good of the person who they, whom they wronged. Okay, so this is the church coming in, looking at it and making a decision uh, can help that person see that and then start to restore justice. Um, also, though, again, it can work in the other direction. And maybe, you know, another look at this will show, again, there's a misunderstanding or uh, this person didn't do anything wrong. Okay, okay, but if the person, uh, if the church, after all these processes and they're done in the right spirit, right? And it goes on in the past, it speaks about doing uh, gathering in the name of Jesus. So they're done in the spirit of Christ in the name of Christ. Um, these are ways of showing uh, what is to be done. And then we have this uh, strong statement where it says, Amen, I say, Jesus says, Amen, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. This is reflecting uh, what well, said to St. Peter just a couple of chapters earlier in the Gospel of Matthew. Right, so again, this is a passage, or at least for me, it's like, there's questions. Well, uh, well, sometimes can't the church leadership get a decision like this wrong? Right, we're not talking about infallibility or uh, teaching that, um, you know, about doctrine or dogma here. But let's say a church uh, you know, has to decide some leadership in the church, has to decide about some dispute um, about wronging someone, it's probably stealing or something like that. Uh, Church leaders can get that wrong. So the say it's bound in heaven. Okay, so it's, there's a lot of questions can come up there. And, and I don't claim to know all the answers about this, but you can meditate on it and think about it. And uh, even if you don't come to a final or a very convincing reading of the text, that could be helpful. So I encourage you to do that. Um, but again, perhaps the qualification here is that this is all done as a, in a genuine process and uh, in the right spirit, and a love for Christ and uh, for the church community. And then maybe it's, again, a way of discerning. If this is what the church decides, then God will want that to be followed. Okay, and so it's bound in heaven. Okay, so it's a way of discernment. One way of looking at this. Again, I don't claim to answer all the, uh, know all the answers to the, the questions that come up. That's why, again, it's, some of those texts, there's a lot of questions, a lot of things to think about. But with those kind of texts, let me add this. Uh, we keep them in mind. They're in the back of our mind sometimes, too. And every once in a while, think about them. Or some situation will come up that will recall that scripture passage, and then we'll see what, what is like a, this nugget of wisdom in the passage. So sometimes it's only later, uh, as we're going through life experiences, that the wisdom of a scripture passage will come up, and then we can appreciate it then. But thinking about it, pondering it, it's all, it's all good, and we can come to some insights. Um, if not to what the text means, at least about the subject matter, uh, we're better, or kind of, kind of, uh, bettered ourselves in a way by just thinking in this uh, in a prayerful spirit about these subjects and coming to some uh, you know some better insights about them okay so from these meditations then we would move to the third step and the third step is to pray and we're going to pray in the sense of asking God for something and we're going to ask for something based on what we meditate on what we came to appreciate to see to understand better um, that'll be like forming they'll be forming our prayer our petition so I'll offer a prayer, and uh, I'll pause for a moment for you to offer your own prayers. Almighty God, we ask that you help me to fulfill my role within the church community of justice, of helping the community be strong in your ways, to walk in righteousness. When I feel that someone has wronged me, prevent me from acting out of knee-jerk anger, but to be kind of procedural about it, to be um, careful and, and to follow a careful process of reasoning and 
um, planning how to right that wrong, how to correct the wrong, so that I don't act rashly. I ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Then for the fourth step of Lexi Divina, we contemplate, and here, as I've said before, uh, our prayer in a way aligns our will with God. When we ask for good things, uh, we're asking for what God wants. So we're, our will is aligning with God's will. And so that allows us to kind of come close to God. And then it's in that closeness, in that petition that brings us close to God, we simply rest uh, in his presence. And so that's one way of understanding this fourth step of contemplation. So let's just pause for a few moments, be mindful of our petition and resting in that alignment of our will with God's. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for joining me for this talk, Lexio. I hope it's helped. Uh, know of my prayers, and please pray for us here at St. Procopius Abbey. God bless.